It is my pleasure to welcome Rabbi Pat Hickman, friend of ours from the Interfaith. We thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Welcome to Rabbi Pat Hickman. Hello, all of you on online. And I cannot thank you enough for asking me to share some of my the love of mystical Judaism with all of you today. Um, I'm very touched, deeply touched by the beautiful prayers that we just said and um, see the variety of, of, of elements that are used within your service are uh, touch me deeply and are very much part of uh, the Judaic tradition as well. So thank you so much for, for sh sharing that with me. <laughs> so um, the topic of the Kabbalah is, is so vast and would take a lifetime to study, really. So I, I'm going to just touch a little bit on one of the, the most important parts of it that have influenced me in my life. But first I want to see, to first to share with you really what, what the Kabbalah is. The, the word Kabbalah actually means to receive. And what are we receiving? We're receiving a collection of methods and teachings that are used in an attempt to help us understand the nature of the universe, including how and why we were created. It's long been a secret teaching, and there were always stringent rules about how to study it. It dates back to the oldest of the Jewish sages, and many believe was handed down to us through Moses himself. As it says in some of the rabbinic writings, Moses received Torah on Sinai. Torah is the first five books of Moses of, the, of our Bible. And he subsequently transmitted it to Joshua. And Joshua transmitted it to the elders. And the elders transmitted it to the prophets. And then the prophets transmitted it to the men of the great assembly. And so the ancient teachings were taught orally. And it wasn't until quite a bit later that they were actually written down to preserve them. One of the greatest Kabbal Kabbalistic scholars of our time said, and his name was Arya Kaplan, he said throughout the period of the prophets, the Kabbalah was guarded by the master prophets. And we're, we're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then transmitted to select disciples. And during this time, the sanctuary and later the first temple served as the focal point for all of the prophetic experiences. And if you read through some of the books of the prophets, you'll see many mystical experiences that they had um, and their teachings and the way they meditated and the way they were able to talk to God and reach God. It's all there in their stories particularly if we think of the prophet Ezekiel. He was shown a vision that was to signal the end of a thousand-year period of prophecy. The vision is known as Maase Merkava, the discipline or the workings of the chariot. It's the one where, the, where he gets into the chariot and it takes him up to heaven. Um, some of these visions are, are quite wild. <laughs> um, and so by the time of the building of the second temple, the keys to the Kabbal Kabbalistic tradition were entrusted to the last prophets of the Jewish people, as well as to its greatest sages. And together they constituted the 120 men of what they called the Great Assembly. It was this body that formulated some of the most famous rabbinic teachings that are found in a book called the Mishnah, and then later in the Talmud, another great book that and these are all commentaries on the on the Torah which uh, Christians would say is the um, is the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament but for Jewish people it's it's our testament that's it <laughs> so that gives you just a little bit of the how awesome and awe-inspiring these ancient texts are and this, the, these ancient practices. 
So I'm going to talk mostly today about what we refer to as the tree of life. And I'll tell you a little story. In the beginning of time, there was a tree that grew in Eden. Now this tree bore 10 branches and each branch was touched by a particular power of God. When the mystics meditated on the symbols of this tree, they saw each of the 10 branches open to reveal one of the 10 heavenly gates. Each gate led to a path that connected to the powers of heaven with the powers of the earth, the powers of God and the powers that are within each human being. Our mystics believe that the tree of life represented the essential foundation of creation. They looked to the Torah and discovered that there were 10 statements believed that these 10 are what the mystics refer to as emanations. Each emanation of God has many shadings and the basic ones in combination with other ones form everything in creation and it's all one, whether physical, emotional, intellectual, or spiritual. The emanations are called spherot. Spherot actually means numbers because every possible number in creation is a combination of the 10 basic numbers from zero to nine. So whenever the number 10 is found in the Torah, it's related in some way to the tree of life. So somebody tell me one, one example of that. Where, where is 10 important in the Bible? The 10 commandments. Yeah, the 10 commandments. Oh, <laughs> okay. What else? I'll give you a hint. The story of the exodus from Egypt. The 10 plagues. The 10 plagues. And then the Jewish people celebrate the Jewish New Year on a holiday called Rosh Hashanah. And then 10 days later is the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. So we have this 10 uh, kind of always there somehow uh, within our just and there and numbers are very important in Judaism because all of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet also equal numbers so there's a whole study which is part of Kabbalah um, a called numerology where you can take a word and add up the numbers that each of the letters represent and get a number that that then then me, uh, means something else on another Hebrew word. You can, can connect these two words together. So it's, the rabbis have a lot of fun doing that. I, I'm, not, I'm not really as into numbers <laughs> as I am into the, the spirit of our hearts, but this is uh, very much part of it as well. So let's, um, let's take a look at this tree of life. If we could put it up there, that would be wonderful. Oh, yeah. And I have, I have some hard copies of it for those of you who would like it. Is there someone who could maybe hand these out to folks? Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and if this is the first time you've ever seen this, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So, and I don't want to overwhelm you, but I do want to give you a taste of it. And if something within it makes you feel like you want to study more than by all means, this is a good gateway to it. So here we have what is referred to as the tree of life. And one of the great, greatest Kabbalists of our, of our more modern times who lived in the 1600s and taught in the city Tzvat in um, Israel, Isaac Luria, this was his concept and uh, it's very much the study of more modern Kabbalists today. So if we take a look at the very top, we see the word keter, which means crown. And I'll just go through them. On the right side is chokhmah, wisdom. And right across from it is bina, understanding. 
And then below on the right side, again, we have chesed, which means loving kindness. And on the left side is gevura, which means judgment or strength, might. And then right in the middle, you see the word tiferet, that means beauty or compassion. And then again, on the right-hand side, you have the word netzach, which means eternity. And then across from it is hod, which means splendor or beauty or majesty. And then the little orange one <laughs> down at the bottom is yesod, that's the foundation. And I'm going to go through each of these and explain them in more detail. And then at the very bottom, we have malchut, which also is referred to as Shekhinah. Shekhinah is the feminine aspect of God. So um, Malchut is the masculine and Shekhinah is the feminine. So, and it means kingdom, God's kingdom here on earth. So it really is like Mother Earth to me. <laughs> All right, so each one of us actually is a tree of life. So within us are all of these emanations. They are within God, and God used them to create the world, and they are within us. And many Kabbalists even believe that every single thing in the world is a tree of life. So all the trees are trees of life, and all the animals, and the, even the stones, and the mountains, and every part of our earth is all has all of these parts within them. Now, here's the trick. The trick is to find a balance with them. And that will help us to go out into the world and bring harmony and balance to all that we encounter, which we are in great need of doing. Our world is completely out of balance. So by studying these different emanations or characteristics um, or qualities and bringing them into balance with each other, we can help to bring balance within our world. Um, you, you notice that there's a right side, as I mentioned, and a left side, and then a center column as well. And you know the other thing that you can do is you can imagine you can imagine this tree of life actually on you. And so as we go through these different qualities, I'm going to explain what part of the body they're connected to within our bodies. So you can, if, you, if you imagine superimposing this on top of a figure of a person. Just. Okay, so as you can see from the diagram and the description of the spherot, the left side of the tree corresponds to attributes of power and justice. And those are characterized by givura. And this is seen by the Kabbalists as the feminine side of God, representing the fear and awe of God, the principles of separation and distinction. By contrast, the right side is considered the masculine side, represents qualities of unity, harmony, and benevolence, the attributes that characterize chesed, which is loving kindness. But the two, but the world can only survive if it's founded between balance of the two. And you may never look at an actual tree again in the same way. But let's start first with the keter, the crown. This is the first sphera, and I've, I've taken up this past year a deep study of the first three that are on the top. And they're the ones that are the most elusive, very, very difficult to understand. As we, as we work our way down, the other ones are qualities that are all within us, and it's easier to relate to them. But it's really hard to understand what God is, and that the concept of it is so difficult because it's, it's, it doesn't, to, to the Jewish people, it, God doesn't have a face. God is just really everywhere. God is one, and everything's connected to God. So um, Keter means crown, and um, it's the nearest in proximity to 
Ein Sof, which is what is referred to as nothingness. And that may be, that's God. And as such, it is said to crown all the others. So Keter is said to rest on the edge between infinity and the finite world. Keter acts as a barrier between the other nine spherot and the infinite Ein Sof, the infinite nothingness. It is also the divine principle that sits atop the middle pillar of the tree of life known as the will of God. Keter, um, what's really fascinating is, is that above Keter, which you don't see there, but if, ain, if nothingness is above Keter, when God decided that God wanted to create a world, there had to be first a longing, a yearning. So just like when you want to create anything, the first impulse to come is that yearning, that wishing and praying that something could be. But it's nebulous. And then all of a sudden, as you move down the tree, it's the wisdom and the understanding that can then perhaps make this thing become a reality. Um, you also notice that there are colors. Now, the colors could be another whole time together. <laughs> but I just will point out to you what the colors, and there are different Kabbalists who say that there are different colors. You know, nobody ever agrees on everything all the time. <laughs> and you'll definitely find that within Judaism. OK, so um, it says in the book of Job, wisdom comes into being from nothing. And perhaps it's that flash of knowledge. The body part associated with Keter is our aura, the whatever light is above us. We all have an aura, and that's our, that's, uh, our Keter. And it has no color. Um, the next one is Chochmah, wisdom. So that represents that first impulse to create as it arose in the creator. Chochmah is the first of the spherot that we can begin to actually understand. In scripture, Chochmah is said to have been with God at the creation of the world. It says in the book of Proverbs, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. As mentioned, Keter is associated with the infinite Ein Sof and the divine will of God, and is quite unknowable as this is outside the realm of creation. By comparison, Chochmah is considered to be the totality of all things to later come into creation, and it's the highest characteristic of God. It's like a blueprint, like the blueprint for creation. It is said that by Chochmah, all things exist. Chochmah, in general, is general in nature, consisting of vast ideas and concepts of God. And um, it states in one of the great books of the Kabbalah called the Zohar, it says that in the Zohar, it talks about breaking up the word Chochmah into two words. So Koach means potential. And ma means what is. So thus, kochma means the potential of what is, or the potential to be. And the body part associated with kochma is the right hemisphere of the brain. And kochma's color is blue. So all of you who, who go back home later and look and see what colors are in your house and which colors you seem to really you know, uh, are drawn to. I know uh, I'm drawn to pink, which is really interesting because um, the, the, the pink, light and dark pink are uh, a little further down on the, with Hod and Netzach. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so Chesed, okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, Bina. Bina is understanding. It represents the point at which the divine inspiration begins to take some kind of form. And some refer to chokhmah as the contemplative and synthetic element of divine thought, 
By contrast, Bina is seen as analytical and distinguishing. The uppermost female element of the sphera, Bina is the womb into which the sperm of Hochma was deposited. From that union, the lower seven sphero were born. To put it differently, Bina, which is also translated as insight or discernment, is the point at which the flash of intuition is refined into a conscious thought. And we're going to find many sexual references within Kabbalistic teachings. Um, after all, it is through this intimate act that we can create. We are partnered with God in the many acts of creation. And so it's very openly discussed and talked about. So now we move into the seven lower. Uh, is, is everybody with me? Any questions so far? Okay. So now we're going to come to the next three that make that little triangle, chesed, givura, and teferet. And teferet is the balance between chesed and givura, and that's what we're all searching for. The lower seven represent our ordinary consciousness. Everything that normally goes on in our minds are a combination of the lower spherot. They are the physical universe. So let's take a more in-depth look at what they represent. Chesed, generosity, loving kindness. It's the part of us that yields, even though another part says no. The tendency of chesed is to be giving in the extreme. Uncontrolled, it has the potential to smother the recipient. It has no self-limitation. It only knows how to give. How many of you here are more chesed than anything else. <laughs> As Rabbi David Cooper describes it, pure generosity will keep piling the food high on the plate. It will spin cotton candy until it fills the circus tent. It will give away the family jewels. <laughs> now that corresponds to the right arm. And chesed's color is white. Now right across from it, we have givura which is strength, judgment, and uh, restraint. Setting boundaries. Who has trouble setting boundaries? <laughs> okay. Givara has always been very troublesome for me. It's often thought of as a judgment or a setting of limits. It's hard for me to say no. And since I have a very strong voice within that often is critical of me, I need the strength be able to discern what is best for me and how I want to live my life. We need this strength to keep us moving, to keep us walking, despite the many obstacles that we find in our path of life. With givura, we can face our fears and move on beyond them. Too much givura, though, can at times feel cold-hearted. It needs chesed to temper it and help it to find a balance. I once had the honor of having an amazing ritual created for me to help embrace givura. As I passed around a circle of loving friends, each person blessed me with strength through dance, music, and words of love. It was a profound experience that I carry with me, especially whenever I doubt my ability to be strong in the face of life's obstacles. Givura is that dynamic energy that combined with keset, chesed can create love and unconditional love, the kind of love that this world surely needs. This is the love with which I bless all of you. One of my teachers says that givura is like a riverbank that keeps the flowing water contained. The Zohar teaches us that an excess of givura is the source of ultimate evil. So the balance between justice and mercy that is repeatedly taught to us in the Torah is the key to the world's thriving. We have too much givura, too many people trying to control everything else that's going on in our world. And that is, our, I believe, our prop, one of our major problems. Now it corresponds to the left arm, and its color is red. And Somehow red seems fitting for givura. Now, if 
the two qualities, Gibura and Chesed, are balanced, we come to Teferet, which is in the middle, and it's beauty. Because the poles of Chesed and Givorah constantly pull and tug on one another, a balance point or a pendulum is needed to balance the two. And it's never static. You know, sometimes we're a little more Chesed, sometimes we're a little more Givorah, but the idea is to try to find that balance within. Uh, neither too self-indulgent or too self-restrictive. It's the torso of the body that corresponds to Tiferet, and Tiferet's color is purple. Purple. <laughs> now we come down to the lower part, and this is very much thought of as the feminine aspects of God, the Inetzach, Hod, and Yisod. Netzach holds the quality of endurance and victory with its light. What does it mean to be victorious, and who or what are you victorious over? Victory can be over something outside ourselves, an enemy or a rival, or it could be victorious over something within ourselves that we are unhappy with and want to change. 26 years ago, I, it was discovered that I had breast cancer. So I'm a 26-year-old breast cancer survivor. <laughs> You too? Yeah. But, yes. So 26 years ago, I could have caved into that illness and let it overcome me. But I harnessed my netzach, my endurance, and became victorious over it. I'll never forget my first chemo treatment when the red poisonous medicine entered me. I turned my fear into triumph imagining the liquid entering my veins as a warrior that was going to burn away all the cancerous cells. It was very hard to serve, continue serving as a clergy person during that time, but it brought me great strength as well. So the right leg is connected to Netzach, and its color is light pink. So then we have hod, which means splendor. It also can mean humility. What is hod, which means splendor? Can you step out of your way? Can you surrender to something beyond your very being? In the 12-step programs, of which some of you may be familiar, this is one of the most important principles. Let go and let God in letting go of the insanity that many of us live in every day, in trying to control everyone's outcome in, the, in our world, we can find a peace of mind that we dreamed, never dreamed imaginable. Now, hod also comes from the word hoda'a, which is saying thank you, and is the name of our thank you prayer that we say every day. It is saying thank you to God. When you surrender, you can very clearly recognize your gifts, strength, and qualities, and that they are not your own. They were given to you by God. When you are filled up with yourself, there's no room for God. When you empty some of yourself from the cup, then the joy of God can enter. Hod is also associated with the power of prophecy. It's the left leg, and it's dark pink. Finally, we come to Yesod, which is the foundation. That is creativity itself. It is the spiritual foundation and the creativity that produces the generations. With creativity, we can birth a child, a new endeavor, and a new concept. The sky is the limit as to how much we can create in our lives. Yesod is the foundation we can stand on to spring into new worlds of thought and action. It is, the body part is our genitals, the source of generative energy. Of course, sexuality is a powerful force. If used in a positive way, it can connect us and create. If misused, it can result in violence, abuse, hurt, and pain. Its color is orange. And I'm, I'm trying to figure that one out but it's orange, maybe because it burns brightly like a candle. 
At the very bottom of our chart here, of the Sfirot, we have our indwelling presence, Malchut Shekhinah. The Zohar says that Malchut Shekhinah is the mouth of God. It is God within and without, receiving all of our yearnings and reminding us that God is within every aspect of our world. I think of it as the masculine and the feminine aspects that all blend together from the tree above and come down to that point. It's the culmination and the synthesis of all the attributes of God, the recipient of all the forces in play in the delicate balance of the spherot and the quality that links the eternal sovereign to the real world. It's, I think of it very much as Mother Earth. In some Kabbalistic systems, Mahut corresponds to the feet, but in others, it is said to be associated with the mouth. So go figure that out. We're not gonna try to tackle that one today. Mahut's color is sort of a blue-black. So what qualities do you think you would like to work on for your own life, for the betterment of your life? Uh, to leave you with, um, with chesed, which is loving kindness, um, I'd like to conclude with a uh, loving kindness meditation, which is Jewish uh, meditation. Uh, but you're going to, some of you who have uh, studied Buddhism, will remind, it may remind you of the Buddhist metta practice, the loving kindness practice. It's very similar. And, and don't forget that, um, that these different peoples in, in antiquity, they, they, must, they crossed each other. Jew, the Jewish people wandered for so many years and they were always, they were often the ones that would bring goods to other countries and the ones that would travel to other places because they didn't, they didn't have a homeland anymore. So I think that that exchange happened and that's a beautiful thing to think. <laughs> So if you, if you uh, are used to meditating, you'll know what I mean when I say to take um, three deep cleansing breaths. And as you breathe in, you breathe in light and you breathe out whatever tension may be within you. Put your feet, both feet on the floor so you can feel Mother Earth beneath you. We're going to open our hearts. In Judaism, we hold the understanding that God loves not only the people of Israel, but all humankind. And this love is revealed by God's acts of compassion and kindness toward us. At the same time that we are loved, we are also told to love God. As it says in the book of Deuteronomy, you shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This outpouring of love on our part is our response to the divine love we have received. When you are ready to begin, focus on opening your heart. As you inhale, visualize your heart softening, receiving love from God, from those close to you, even from strangers. Those unexpected moments so large and so small when you receive this gift. As you exhale, let the love pass through you and beyond to those you already love, to those you hardly know, to those with whom you are angry, and to strangers. When your mind wanders, notice where it has gone and return to the focus. When you become distracted, bring your attention back 
to chesed. Breathe in, receiving love. Breathe out, radiating love. Chesed, loving kindness. There for all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we do. May your loving kindness, which you share with the world, help to heal our broken world. Amen.